Peter, look, it's great to catch up with you. I've not seen you in a while. Unfortunately, this is electronically and not in person. But, you know, it's always brilliant to be able to sit and pick your brains in what you think is going on. You know, none of us have a crystal ball, but we're just all observing things and trying to figure out, you know, what the probabilities are of certain outcomes. So, look, I really thank you for your time as ever. Oh, you bet. It's always my pleasure to be with with you, Raul, and with your wonderful audience at Real Vision TV. You know how much I respect you guys. You know how much I love you and been down there in the Cayman with you. And uh, I always, always cherish the opportunity to chat with you about the markets. Fabulous. So, Peter, let's start at a very top level. Um, you know, we've seen some tremendous price action. In, let's, let's start with equities for the time being as a place to start. What do you think is playing out here? Because the market is trying to grapple with, is this a shorter term thing or is this potentially a larger thing? Um, and, you know, I've been, you know, I've made my opinion quite clear that I think it's possibly something larger. What do you, when you look at the top down picture, what do you think of this? In terms well, of charts. Yeah, I, I mean, you're the guy that really understands global macro stuff and fundamentals. I'm not. I mean, I look at charts and draw funny little lines and, and try to make sense of it and think in terms of possibilities. And uh, that's how I'm viewing this in terms of possibilities uh, that it obviously can modify or change or morph over time. But, uh, you know, I've traded markets for a living since 1974, and I've never really seen anything quite like we have had the last two months. This is unprecedented. You know, I was in, in the market. Some people tease me that, you know, they say, how does this compare with the Great Depression market? You know, because I'm one of the older guys in here. <laughs> and uh, I missed that one by 12 years. But, uh, you, you know, this is absolutely crazy. And I guess I subscribe to the theory where there's smoke, there's fire, or, or there's definitely something hot going on. And, of course, you know, we all know that it's tough to fade the Fed. You don't want to fight the Fed. And the fight is uh, the Fed's not only throwing the kitchen sink, they're throwing everything in the kitchen, including a broken toaster at this thing. And, uh, you, you know, I'm just surprised that we've seen the rally that we've seen. And so I see that the type of decline that we had, you know, coming off the highs this year as really the possible beginning of, you know, of a pretty serious decline. It's all pretty much gone to script since this market has rolled over, including this rally that we had. We just got we got overdone on the downside. You know, taking the, the S&P back to, you know, 2180 or so was a little bit too much for, for the first big leg down. But you look at the volume that has come in here. Uh, you know, in my mind, huge slugs of volume is either starting volume or stopping volume. And so we could say all of this, uh, huge slug of volume is, is really just demand coming in off the bottom. It's really difficult for me when I look at circumstances, possible 20, 30 percent unemployment in the U.S., lowest retail sales in history, still uh, the threat of a, of a global virus, a health virus, to think, uh, you know, I kind of go, hey, for the few stocks that I still own, if somebody wants to come in and pay me an all-time high price for them, they can have them. Uh, and so, I, you know, I, I'm viewing this thing, Raul, as really the first big leg down in what could potentially be a more significant bear market that this rally that we've had in the S&P is up into this 2,800 level. It may be all it is. Uh, last Friday, I wrote a fairly long uh, letter to the people who follow me uh, for the Factor Research Service, and I explained them why last Friday I sold every last share of stock that I owned. I, I managed to ride through some shares all the way down, wrote them all the way back, and I, I explained in the letter, I'm getting out of everything. I don't want to own any stock here. And, and uh, you know, I was lucky last Friday we'd taken out last Friday's low or high, but we've now sold off. So as a technician, I'm viewing the S&Ps as a possible massive head and shoulders top. We put in the left shoulder in 2018. That's where the high came in. We dropped down into that December 
2018 low, which is kind of the left shoulder low, then we rallied into the high early this year, and this big drop that we've had is the right shoulder low. And now we're rallying back toward that left shoulder high. So somewhere between 2,800 and 2,950, I really anticipate that we're going to see a right shoulder high roll over and then really begin uh, the, the, the bear move that's yet to come. Yeah, and it's fascinating because you reached out to me on Friday and said, hey, listen, this is what I'm thinking. And I was like, or was it Friday? Whatever day you reached out, I'm like, you know, I hadn't even really looked at that because I was so intensely looking at at the chart in a different way. And I looked and I thought, you know, that makes total sense. It's It could be an even bigger top pattern than I really had in my head. Um, and I thought, huh. And I was also eyeing this 50% retracement thinking, you know, this is an area that you could possibly stop. Now, it actually has stopped around that. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Maybe it goes up further. But it's really interesting to me. And and I just don't think people are prepared for that kind of outcome. Now, again, as we've always said, look, it's going to chart that play out that way. Um, but it just looks interesting, I think. I think there's a really good chance that you're right on this. You know, if you strip out dividends, the break that we had in 2008 in the S&Ps was down right around 54, 55%. Uh, so you apply that to uh, the S&Ps today and say, certainly we can create just as negative global macro scenario today as we could back during the mortgage crisis. You know, that takes the S&Ps back into the area of, of you know, uh, 1700. And so even if we have a 50 percent correction in the S&Ps from this year's high, you know, all of a sudden we're looking down in the area of 1700. But if we go to 1700, we cl- we complete the head and shoulders top and we then potentially go a lot further. And what would be the measuring objective that head and shoulders top, you think, roughly? Well, I'm I'm going to pump this out because I think to to look at it, we we can't really do it arithmetically. I think we have to probably look at it, Raul, on a, on a on a log chart basis. And uh, you know, if we look at it on a log chart basis, it can get it can get pretty hug, ugly. You know, we we could be looking at prices potentially down in the area of oh, uh, thirteen fourteen hundred on the S and P's. Wow. So when I when I when I read a chart that way, I then often start to look around at other supporting evidence that that could be the case. So if you're looking at anything within equity world or sector world, are you picking up similar things that saying, huh, OK, this fits in with that kind of point of view? And not necessarily uh, in terms of sectors, uh, because I'm generally, there's way too many stocks. I'm a futures trader. I'm a forex trader. And so when I try to put together uh, a mini narrative, so to speak, uh, on a more composite basis, for me, I don't wander all the way into sectors because that's just too deep a water for me. Sure. Uh, rather, I'll tend to look at uh, what's going on in a composite of other markets. Yeah. And there, I think I can create the story because uh, a significant downside move in the equity market makes sense to me. For instance, when I look at metals, uh, when I especially look at interest rates, all of a sudden a mosaic comes together that says, you know, if this happens, then that would make sense to what I'm seeing, for instance, over in the 10 year, the 10 year, the five year, the 30 year, the, the euro dollars, all of a sudden uh, that would tend to line up. And, and that indeed is, I think is what we're seeing. Yeah. I mean, I looked at, I mean, I do a similar process as you by seeing how things evolve on, on a, across all asset classes. The CRB index and any of the kind of commodity based index, you know, big, uh, huge top patterns, you know, big, massive m- monthly head and shoulders tops and stuff like that, that I've never seen in my career. In fact, I've never seen them on the chart in history before, tops of this size. And I look at that and think, wow, I don't, you know, and oil is obviously playing itself out. How do you see that commodity complex right now? What's, what's interesting to you and how are you reading it? You know, I, I have, 
I have mixed devotions there. You know, I started as a corn trader. I understand the corn market. I look at the price of corn, and you know, with the decline that we're seeing in corn as we speak today, we're we're down in an area that we haven't seen in a number of years. As a matter of fact, when I started trading corn in 1974, 1975, corn was trading not adjusted for inflation, but trading at approximately the same price it's trading today. And so we've see, we're seeing corn prices right where they were in 1975 and 1976. You know, that's, that's almost a 50-year period of time corn prices haven't gone up. And, of course, American farmers would be the first ones to, to remind us all of that. Um, and, and corn is a perfect example. We have a potential huge head and shoulder stop on the weekly continuation chart in corn. But and so I'm kind of split between what's a basic value or at least value relative to what my experience is and just the pure chart pattern itself. Pure chart pattern itself in corn tells me that uh, the, corn, the raw material prices can go substantially lower. But yet there's kind of a value investor part of me, too, that uh, that goes, wow, uh, I have a chance to own corn at 50 year lows. That's a pretty that's a pretty cool deal. Yeah. And that's not the same in metals, I guess. Metals are still more elevated overall. Yeah, they are. They are. And of course, crude oil is getting back there, too. I mean, crude oil is, is back in areas where I traded crude oil back in the low teens. In the past, it's been a number of years, but you know, they're getting back in there. But yeah, raw material prices are very weak. For instance, when we look at, uh, at data adjusted sugar prices, which, you know, which go back and adjust prices to take away the roll charges we have from going to one futures contract to the next, we're at all time lows. We have never had sugar prices as low as they are today on a back adjusted price chart basis. And so uh, there's a number of commodities that look that way. Same thing with some of the livestock markets, as cheap as can be. Uh, there's part of me, though, particularly in some raw materials where I, I kind of go, you know, even on a global macro basis, I, I can't really become a bear. I think wheat prices are a perfect example. Uh, you know, people are going to have to still still eat. And uh, so, you know, there is the basic necessity of human beings to consume food. And so if I'm looking at wheat prices and saying we're already down in the area of, of the, the same level as I traded wheat prices back in the, in the mid-70s, uh, you, maybe I can't just get all bared up. There's a better place to be a bear, I guess is what I'm telling yeah. you. If I'm going to be a bear, it's not going to be on raw material prices. I'll be a, I'll be a bull on interest rate futures, I'll be a bear on equities, and, you know, I'll look to trade the grain. And the commodity price is telling you that it's consistent with the equity market falling further is the fact that commodities look weak, whether they rebound, you know, whether ags rebound or not. Okay, but it looks weak as a structure. What are you seeing in the FX market? Because I'm mesmerized by the chart of the euro right now. I will tell you, I, I'm looking for you to share your wisdom on here. And let, let me tell you why, because, yeah, I'm a technician, but, you know, I'm not I'm not deaf to everything that's going on in the world. Right. I mean, I, I'm, I still live here on this planet. And so I'm looking and going, we've got a Fed that just is into QE infinity. I, I mean, it, the, the word infinity has now been adjusted by the U.S. Fed. I mean, they're throwing everything on here. So part of me goes, wow, uh, that has to lead me to uh, a bias that the U.S. dollar could get really clobbered. Uh, and I tried my hands here in the last week or so with the long side of, of, of the euro, the, the euro FX. I got run out on stops for a break even trade today. But I'm, but the kind of behind the scenes, I'm thinking, wow, this can't be constructive for the dollar for uh, the, the Fed to just flood the globe with greenbacks. But then I look at the euro chart and I go, we ever get under 105? 80 cents, here we come. And so in the back of my mind, I'm aware of the fact that the 50 year trend line in the euro currency. Now people will say, well, the euro hasn't been around for 50 years. How do you get that? Well, you get that because prior to the euro, you can put together a, 
uh, a trade weighted basket of the old European currencies and you, you know, which become a proxy for the euro. And so you, you track that back into the seventies. We have a 50 year trend line that has held on a number of occasions in the euro currency. Well, we, we're, we've tested that hard here this year. We take out 105 in the euro currency. And boy, that's all she wrote. Then, then sure. I, then I really have to turn and say, I don't know the story beyond the dollar, but I have to be bullish on the dollar. You see, I hear the narrative of the Fed printing. I hear it. I see the Fed doing stuff. I look at the charts and I look at the charts of stuff like the euro, which seems like it's forming this huge and powerful triangle. Whichever way it breaks is going to be a massive move. Because of the 50-year trend line, that would be a spectacularly powerful move should it move lower. It's one I don't want to miss, let me tell you that. Um, so I'm looking at that and hearing the narrative, and I love it when the narrative is the opposite to what the charts are telling me. You know, I look at you know, corrective price action in other currencies. Do you, have you ever looked at – you can't trade it, but I don't know if you ever looked at the ADXY. It's the Asian currency. And that has got this massive multi-year, multi-decade head and shoulders top. Mm-hmm. And I look at that, it makes me go, same thing. I look at that, and I look at those commodity charts, and I look at the head and shoulders in the S&P, and I look at that euro chart, and I'm like, this looks like it's got a massive dollar rally and a debt deflation written all over it. And, you know, if everybody in a debt deflation owes dollars, that's why the dollar goes up, simply. And you can print as many as you want, but nobody's got the cash flow to pay it back. It's just a good old-fashioned short squeeze, right, is really what you have. Is you got, huh? you got the, the entire world's commerce system is in a short dollar position. Um, and you, you get the entire global economic system short dollars, and all of a sudden you hit some key chart points and certain things happen. Uh, on the fundamental side on what's going on in the world, and you've got to scramble to cover short dollar positions. So I'm going to ask you a really hard question because nobody can get this one right. What is what is the longer term chart of dollar yen to you, up or down? Confusing because it's a triangle, and I hate triangles. Yeah. Uh, you know, Raul, we've talked about that. I tend to like patterns when the breakout of a pattern really is through a horizontal line. Uh, diagonal lines tend to give you fake false starts, tends to give you a, a further morphine, it'll fake you out. Uh, but, uh, and so I'm confused on the end. The end chart has absolutely been a nightmare to me for a long time, but I do see the coil. The yen is coiling up. Boy, I'll tell you, you know, it's the old, the old analogy of you take a beach ball and you, you know, you, you push it down under the water. And you try to hold it there, and you hold it there, and you hold it there. Sooner or later, that thing's going up. And so I look at this, and I look at that euro chart, and I look at that ADXY chart, and I look at the commodities chart, and I'm like, huh, dollar yen could go to 200, which is what, again, the opposite of everybody's narrative. Now, I could be dead wrong. I could be building a false narrative myself. But I just look at it because of that coiling pattern and the fact that it, it, it hits low a while ago. It looks like it's building strength. For dollar yen to go higher. Oh, well, I think you're right. I mean, we take out this year's existing high in a, a, a dollar yen. Uh, you certainly you want to place your bets on, on on a currency that's got a lot of green ink, uh, <laughs> and, and that's the U.S. dollar. But we continue to coil, and as you know, sometimes coils can be very difficult. You can do all kinds of weird things in coils. You can kind of have false breakouts and do what uh, what the old chart masters called an end around or an end run. You can do all kinds of sneaky things. So uh, I, in terms of dollar yen, I'd rather just kind of sit back and wait and say, okay, let declare yourself, and I'll try to make sense of it. But in the meanwhile, you know, there are certain places where I definitely want to be, you know, long dollar, for instance, getting the Mexican peso. I, you know, I, uh, a Mexican peso looks to me that no matter what the dollar is going to do, peso looks like it's going to uh, like it's going to go down. The dollar is going to dig gain on the peso as it has really for the last uh, throughout history. 
So, yeah, and I want to kind of wait. I want to kind of keep my eye on it. It's been in this coil. It's done nothing really for the last five, six years. But my eye is really on the euro currency. That's the chart I want to look at. That 105 level is going to be key. The other two charts I want to ask in FX land before we move on to fixed income is, I mean, the long-term chart of dollar Brazil is spectacular. Oh, and there's a futures contract there. That's what I love about it. You put me in the world where I've got a futures contract to trade, and uh, that's marvelous. And so, yeah, and that was a really clean breakout. And a lot of people were scared of the breakout there because they're looking at at the negative carry of the trade, right? They're they're looking uh, they're looking at the big interest rates down in Brazil, so they're short Brazil. They're, and now they're long dollars, so they got to pay the differential, the interest rate differential. But when you get a currency to move like that, I don't care what the interest rate differential is, you're going to make money on it. And so, uh, you know, I, I I look at that, and I just think that uh, that that's a market that's going to go a very long way. And I'll tell you the the price level I think that we go down. And of course, this is. Uh, you know, I think we go down where the real gets back to ten cents, fifteen cents, something like that. So I think that's where we're going. This is a big trend. Now it's late in the game. We've come a long way. You know, we're at nineteen. We were at twenty-five not very long ago. But nevertheless, I I, I do not want to own uh, have, have money sitting in Brazil. What about the RMB? I think uh, same thing. I mean, you just you. you it's the same thing with, with India. Uh, you just really want to own the dollar. You want to own the dollar in those particular currencies, which really comes back to the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm split somewhat, as I think you acknowledged in terms of the dollar index, in terms of the euro. But there are certain currencies where it's a no brainer. And that is, uh, being long dollar against peso against brazil against south africa you know those are plays that 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 make sense and so you know as a trader i always am thinking if i'm going to be long the dollar i want to be long the dollar against the weakest currency there is if i want to be long metals i want to be long the strongest metal i don't want to play catch up i don't want to think well Gold has had a big move, but silver hasn't had a big move, so I'll buy silver. No, I want to be long where the strength is. And so there's already some currencies where the dollar is in a very strong trend. So that's really uh, where I want to be. So let's talk about fixed income, because you and I were swapping notes about that. I think there's some amazing charts currently. You know, they're slightly shorter term than the big picture of charts we've been looking at, but they look really interesting. What's your thoughts? You know, there are longer term charts and there are shorter term charts, but then there are just some asymmetric trades that are just sweet. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and you, know, you, you can give me that off of a monthly chart or you can give me that off a six hour chart, but asymmetrical is asymmetrical. And so, yeah, I, the charts indicate to me and they've indicated to me for a very long time that the U.S. is going to join Western Europe with negative interest rates. Uh, that's the stories the charts told me. When I look at five-year yield charts, when I look at 10-year yield charts, when I look at, uh, at, at Euro-dollar charts, it's telling me we're going to minus 20 to minus 30 basis points. They all target that area. That's where I think we're going. We'll flatten out the yield curve but with perhaps the tail end of it, the, the, the long end will we'll retain some sort of uh, yield to it. But generally speaking, I want to be I want to be long five year notes futures. I'm talking futures now. I want to be long the ten year. I, I want to be long the ultra notes. I got a buy signal today in the bonds. Uh, went with it. We're going to get buy signals in the euro in the euro. So yeah, again, it's a shorter term play. Uh, but hey, uh, I mean, I'll take money when they put on the table, whether I have to reach my hand and keep it there for a year, or I can put it on the table, grab the money, and, and remove it immediately. Well, because look, I mean, for in, in simple terms, I see that saying the long term chart patterns all look like they're going to negative rates. We know that the Fed desperately needs rates to get to zero, and they've been a little bit sticky recently after the 
you know, the first bout of stuff and the illiquidity in the system. So when I look at that five-year note, I mean, it's an, it's a perfect chart pattern here. And it fits the narrative of what the Fed want. The Fed are in your favor here. It's not like shorting stocks where the Fed are trying to do the opposite to you. The Fed are in your favor. We've gone through all of these charts about the potential disinflationary pressures and stuff like the dollar. It just looks like it's an amazing setup. Oh, it, it does. You know, it looks a little bit like it did back in mid-January. You know, we had some wonderful buy signals in, in the in the Treasury futures you know, back mid-January. I mean, it, there were extremely low-risk spots to get in. There was some significant upside targets that we we're looking at. It was an easy play. And then again in mid-February, we had an easy play. It was a layup. There were layups. Um, you called the euro just uh, just wonderfully well uh, in, in all of the interest rates. Well, I think we have a pretty similar thing right now. And we have a lot of people that don't want to believe it. That's what I like about it. You go and put out on Twitter that the charts all look like we're going to a negative interest rate policy in the U.S. You'll get trolled like crazy. I mean, I, I did exactly that, and I got trolled like crazy. Everyone said, yeah. can't you see it's hyperinflation? I'm like, I understand your narrative, but the charts don't tell me that, nor does the dollar, nor do the commodity markets, nor does anything, nor does the equity market. So I understand why you might think it's hyperinflationary, but I don't see it in the charts. It looks like we're going to deflation. Well, it does. You know, I always come back to something I once heard Paul Tudor Jones talk about, and that is it's at that last leg of a market where it's easiest to pick up money. You know, it's it's that last thrust. And so, yeah, they may be right that all of this printing press money is going to eventually take us to higher rates in the future, higher yields in the future. That may be true. But, you know, sometimes when you're too early with an idea, the market will, will punish you. And also in the back of my mind is the fact that this could be that everyone has talked about the big blow off. We've been in this big blow off since, you know, the early 1980s toward uh, toward lower yields. And, and, you know, maybe this is now finally the blow off that takes us from where interest rates were back in 82, 83, 84 to now finally where they go with the negative interest rates. But the charts all indicate to me that in the short term, the risk is in being short treasury futures, not in being long treasury futures. Okay. The next two ones are, are ones that I'm always interested in, as is everybody else. So we've now built, you know, kind of a chart narrative that's interesting. Um, so everybody goes to the next two things, gold, Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, I knew where you were going. I just didn't know what order. <laughs> uh, yeah, but that's a logical order, by the way. I mean, when you stop to think about it, yeah, that, that you're taking things in a very logical, sequential order that here's how dominoes fall. Here you have to figure out. You know, you have to figure out the base of a, of a pyramid before you figure out the top and that sort of thing. So I think it's very logical. So with gold, the fear with gold with me is this divergence. A lot of technical guys that I trust don't trust this rally. But all the fundamentals would suggest it goes further. The positioning is extreme. So I feel nervous and I don't know what to do. I feel a bit trapped. What, what, are, what are you thinking? Well, I, I'm going to go back, Raul, and make a point that I've made in writing a number of times uh, going back to June of last year. In June of last year, we had an upward thrust in the price of gold that completed a massive multi-year chart pattern that gave a target, by the way, of 1778 met two days ago. But the point I'm making is when we started climbing off the bottom in the, in the middle of last year, June, July, August, people were making the point that the commercials were net record shorts. The specs were net record longs in gold. They're going certainly it can't keep going up because the commercials keep selling it. Well, it was interesting they said that because if you went back into history, actually, there was one other time when the commercials had a larger net short position, the specs had a larger net long position, and that point in time 
was just at the very start of a thousand dollar rally in gold that, uh, that happened, that started basically, basically in 2000, I think it was August, September 2009, where gold started a massive move going from a thousand to its eventual high. That had a very similar composition of open interest as we have had during this run up in gold now. So I really don't buy the fact that, oh, my goodness, you've got the commercial stacked up on the short side of gold. Then that obviously has to be bearish because, you know, when you get capitulation by commercials in a market, that is when you get the strongest possible moves is when the commercials are forced to capitulate. And they've been forced to capitulate an awful lot already. They may be forced to capitulate further. You know, we, we created uh, the shakeout in gold that we had. That faked me out a little bit. I mean, it didn't fake out my opinion of gold. What it did is fake out my positioning. It faked out my tactics. It created ha- havoc to my tactics when we I saw had, the, the, the mid March break. It kind of threw me out a bit, and then I've been scrambling on the back, back foot since. So I think we go higher. I mean, we're up here. I think the Elliott guys are all bearish gold, which is usually right. good because the Elliott guys are usually wrong. But, um, y- you know, on everything, although they call the stock market to climb pretty well. So I just think the path of least resistance is off. We have had some really weird things take place in the basis, the basis being price differential between physicals and the nearby future. The, those have been erratic here in the last 30 days or so. They, they've just been completely wacko d- due to uh, deliverables, uh, the position of deliverables against the COMEX contract. But I think gold just continues higher. It, it's probably going to stair step. It's going to it's going to climb uh, a wall of worry. But in my opinion, I think we go 1950, and then I have to rejudge it from there. But having said that, I also have to have full disclosure that having really turned into a significant bull in gold in June of last year, I covered half my position two days ago in gold when it hit my 1778 target. So, but I definitely would be willing to replace that position should we dip back towards 1700. Okay, final one, Bitcoin. That's one where we may find a, a disagreement in. You know, I have been... I'm going to call myself a narrative bull in Bitcoin that, uh, y- you know, the Bitcoin story. Well, and by the way, Raul, for those who don't know, and I've mentioned it before, you're the one that turned me on to Bitcoin. <laughs> and, and I want to thank you for that. And that goes way back. I, I mean, that goes way back into 2016. You mentioned it to me in March of 2016. <laughs> and you sent me a chart and said, Peter, what do you think of this chart? And I looked at it and go, you know, I've heard about this crazy market. This chart is nuts. And, uh, you know, you turned me into an instant one glance of the chart bull and Bitcoin. And, you know, of course, we had the big move, which I thought was really interesting because both you and I position ourselves very well in Bitcoin. But, you know, we both kind of took some off at a thousand and then we got the wrath of God from the trolls. You know, for a triple your money trade, I never could figure that one out. But nevertheless, you know, the the Bitcoin narrative makes sense to me. It makes me want to say Bitcoin to the moon, $50,000 Bitcoin, $100,000 Bitcoin. But boy, is there a big caveat to that. The caveat to me is that Bitcoin right now has every reason in the world to go up. It's monetary supply. It's global uncertainty. It's all kinds of, it's an, it's a strong gold market. It's a weak stock market. My goodness, if Bitcoin can't go up with what we have as a backdrop now, part of me as a technician wants to look for the, you know, look for the shadows in the, in, in, in the, in the, in the dark alleyway, right? And I'm going, this is a market that really should be going up and it's not. But look at the larger wedge. Right, there's a large triangle wedge, whatever pattern you want to call it. Now, could it go back down to the to retest the base of that pattern? Yeah, possible. Now, that could be I don't know exactly where that would be, but it could be three thousand, could be four thousand, could be you know it depends where you draw the line, whether it's an upward sloping or a flat version. I mean, that's possible too. So very possible, and that, by the way, is you know there's a lot of people that criticize both you and I because we periodically change our mind on the necessity. 
you know, we look at a market and we formulate an idea. You think a lot like I think, Raul, and that is strong opinions weekly held. When we have opinions, we have strong opinions. It's necessary to have strong opinions so we can carry a large enough position that if we're right, it becomes meaningful. Yeah. But when presented with new information, we have to reappraise. You know, yeah. there are people who are dogmatic on position. They'll go to their death with the position without changing their mind. And so while I'm nervous with Bitcoin because I feel there are some things I see in the charts that are negative, it's not acting right. I also see the wedge that, that, that you see. I call it a symmetrical triangle. It goes back to the December 2017 highs. Then you have the December 17, uh, 18 uh, lows. Then you go up into the June of 19 high and then the break that we've had recently. And you have a huge symmetrical triangle. Should that symmetrical triangle, if should we bottom in here, go back down to 4,000, 3,800, hold, start up, build something on a daily chart? Yeah, uh, th 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 then yes. And so, yeah, I know it comes across as real weird to people who want to be dogmatic in their thinking, but I have in the back of my mind uh, an interpretation, a labeling of the Bitcoin chart that will take me one way or take me another way. And I don't really care which way it is. Yeah, so for me, I just look at that structure, understand the narrative. I look at that huge structure, the big triangle, and I'm like, okay, I usually know how these play out, particularly when I'm kind of pretty confident of the macro and the fundamental and everything else. Now, the question is, is how does it play out? Yeah, That's yeah. the hard part. And often, it kind of gut checks you once more than you want to be gut checked in a pattern like that. So... You know, maybe it goes lower first, significantly lower. Maybe it only goes half as low because then you've got the idea, yeah, it's definitely going to retest and then it doesn't retest the low. You know, ch these kind of triangle patterns tend to, as you've said before, they tend to morph in ways that kind of frustrate you. But you just know that you're only operating within the context of a much bigger pattern and you'll have plenty of time to get it right. You can either try and buy it lower down, buy it in the middle or buy it on the breakout over the next time horizon, the probability of you being right and it goes up is pretty high, depending on your time, on, depending on the time horizon. Well, I, I, I think that's right. And, you know, I pointed out to people, if you, if you want to just have a very, very simplistic technical approach to trading Bitcoin, just use a simple moving average. I, I don't know what it is. 14 day, 21 day, 30 day. Take your pick. Pick your poison. Because the reality is, let's just say I use for timing sometimes an 18-day moving average. If Bitcoin is going to go from wherever to 50, 20,000, 50,000, 100,000, trading it with a simple moving average is kind of like paying a premium for the fire insurance on your home, right? You don't get your premium back. But what you're assured is if your house builds to the ground, burns to the ground, you're covered. And so I guarantee you one thing, that if Bitcoin goes to $100,000, the 18-day moving average is going to spend most of its time in an up profile. And it's going to keep a person positioned to the, to the right side of the market. And so you can just adopt some very, very simple technical indicators to say, you know, if, if I'm wrong and the 18-day moving average is pointing down, I'm not going to own it or I'm not going to own as much of it. But you just adopt some very, very simple technical indicators that say, you know, this is the insurance premium I am paying to be long should the market have the increase that it could possibly have. I've always said about Bitcoin, I think there's a 50 percent chance it goes to 100,000, but I think there's a 50 percent chance it goes to zero. And so within that parameter, how do I define a, a positive reward to risk profile trade? And so, you know, at Bitcoin at 6,700 or wherever it is today, uh, boy, 100,000 versus zero. And then you add some simple technical indicators. All of a sudden, you know, you have, you have profiled the trade that should be profitable or if not profitable, it's not going to cost you your, your home. Yeah, exactly right. Peter, good. I really want to pick your brains. And it's interesting, you and I are picking up much similar things across the markets. And, you know, they're making us think about it. I think the most important one was the potential for this head and shoulders top in the equity market that nobody's really looking at. 
I look, it's early days, you know, it's down a couple of percent, two or three percent today. Who knows? But it came off the 50 percent level. It's possible. So we'll just see how it plays out from here. But, you know, if I look at all of the evidence you've accumulated and I've accumulated, it's got a probability that somewhere there is a, an, a, another top to come out of equities that could be even larger. Let, let, let's wait and see how it develops. And, uh, and uh, we'll see if these other chart patterns are telling us the right story. Well, you only know until it, when it, after, after the event, right? Yeah, exactly. Then we can celebrate and little came in the other. Exactly. But well, stay there and stay safe. Stay I, safe. I will do, my friend, and stay safe in Arizona, and hopefully we'll get together somewhere in the world soon. Okay. Thanks, Raul. Good to see you again. Yeah. Great to see you. If you're ready to go beyond the interview, make sure you visit realvision.com, where you can try Real Vision Plus for 30 days for just $1. We'll see you next time right here on Real Vision.